but no. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Kawasa Wednesday webinar for operators within the Caribbean region. This is webinar number 17 of the 2021 series. And I'm your host, Ignatius Ja, Executive Director of Kawasa. Our subject today is going to be wastewater management, status, challenges, and emerging opportunities. Our guest presenter today is a program officer with the Ecosystems Division of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. He is based at the Secretariat for the Cartagena Convention in Kingston, Jamaica, which covers all the countries of the wider Caribbean region. He is responsible for the Secretariat's Marine Pollution and Communications subprograms. He's a solution national and has over 30 years of program and project management experience. He has been involved in the development and implementation of multi-country projects on wastewater management, solid waste management, and integrated coastal zone and watershed management. I have to tell you that he's very well known around the region and he knows all parts of the region and, is, and we go way back. And I wouldn't tell you how far back because it will expose our ages, right? So let's welcome Mr. Christopher Corbin of the UN Environment Caribbean to present to us um, on one of his favorite areas, I, I should say. Welcome, Chris, good to have you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ignatius, and, and thank you and, and Kawasa for the opportunity to, to share on an issue that perhaps doesn't get as much publicity as, as some of the other environmental issues in the region, but it, it, it is certainly uh, welcoming to be able to, to share uh, with this group uh, some of the the issues relating to wastewater management, why should it be relevant to you and, and, and your work and perhaps maybe even changing how we think about wastewater. What I'd like to do is, is start off with actually showing a, a very short video, just around two minutes long, uh, that, that speaks a little bit about, about wastewater management. So, um, I'm going to see if this works because I've not really been using um, things too often, but let's see if this will. Yes, it's, it's, it's okay. It's oh, on. Perfect. Okay, so right. I like Zoom. I already like Zoom more than I like Teams, which is the yeah, one we have teams. to use. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let me con right. continue it then. I'm here in the Chesapeake Bay standing at a beach that's been closed because the bacteria level is considered unsafe for swimming. Even here, just 50 kilometers from Washington, D.C., wastewater is a problem. In developing countries, where more than 80% of all wastewater is discharged directly into waterways, it's more than a problem. It's a crisis. We produce wastewater every day when we flush the toilet, take a shower, or wash our dishes. This wastewater typically includes human waste, soaps, solvents, pharmaceuticals, and other chemicals that pollute the water. Industries, hospitals, and farms also generate wastewater, which can contain harmful substances like germs, pesticides, heavy metals, and even radioactive materials. Ideally, wastewater should end up at a treatment plant before it's discharged into water bodies. However, this is often not the case because the infrastructure is either inadequate or non-existent. We've come to rely on natural water bodies and ultimately the ocean as the world's biggest wastewater treatment plant. This is most evident in coastal towns and cities where infrastructure can't keep up with population growth and untreated wastewater flows directly into the ocean. Untreated wastewater is causing numerous problems globally. Most obvious is its threat to human health. 1.8 million children under five die each year due to water-related diseases. On top of that, it's destroying aquatic environments, which provide countless natural benefits, as well as goods and services worth trillions of dollars. Wastewater contributes to dead zones, water environments that are almost completely void of life. It contaminates beaches and threatens tourism, and it generates greenhouse gases that cause climate change. And this is the ultimate irony. 
Wastewater is actually a valuable resource and we're just flushing it away and harming the environment in the process. When properly managed, wastewater can provide solutions to more than one problem. It can be used in agriculture, reducing the need for increasingly scarce fresh water and expensive chemical fertilizers. Wastewater sludge can even be used to manufacture construction materials and generate biogas and biofuels, providing opportunities for green employment and social well-being. So keep this in mind. The ocean is not a free wastewater treatment plant. Preventing untreated wastewater from entering the environment is easier and cheaper than dealing with the consequences of pollution. How can we do this? By increasing our wastewater treatment capacity, protecting and building green infrastructure to better manage stormwater runoff, changing our household, workplace, and industry practices to reduce the amount and toxicity of wastewater, and of course safely reusing wastewater rather than flushing it away. If we manage our wastewater effectively, we can turn a harmful pollutant into a valuable resource. Okay, thank you for viewing. Um, now that essentially is, is, is my presentation, but I'm going to go through uh, the presentation now and hopefully uh, reinforce some of those messages that have been sent in, in that video. And we'll have a couple of opportunities during the presentation to sort of uh, interact a little bit on, on some of the issues that, that will be raised. Uh, confirming that you're seeing the presentation now? Or did I share it? Yes, yes, you, you, shared, you shared it. Okay, perfect. So let me remove this. Uh, this is just reminding people where those voting elements are. And if we get a chance to discuss them, I'm just going to open it up during the course of the presentation. Just take a break and, and discuss a little bit some of your answers. But some of these are also going to be even useful uh, for Ignatius, for ourselves, in terms of some of the work that we would like to do on wastewater moving forward. So the key thing throughout the region is that it's been polluted and the pollution is coming from multiple sources, uh, urban waste, agricultural runoff, mining, wastewater. And a lot of that pollution is because of certain institutional weaknesses that many of you are very familiar with. In some countries, there's limited access to sanitation, uh, poor wastewater treatment, inadequate waste co collection, and in many cases, lack of regulation and enforcement. And this is being then seen in the impacts that it's having, not just on the environment, but also on human health. So we have a contamination by bacteria, we have degradation of both terrestrial and marine habitats. And perhaps where we are not doing enough in quantifying these impacts are the impacts on our socioeconomic sectors, on tourism, on fisheries, on health, or should I say avoided healthcare costs, and on coastal development. And the situation of wastewater treatment in the region is, is not so good. It, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. And, and, and this was a, a bit of a study that we did at, at UNEP Cartagena Convention Secretariat to document the amount of wastewater that's treated throughout the region. And, and you would find that on average throughout the Caribbean, throughout the wider Caribbean, including Latin America, we are somewhere within the zero to 20%. Uh, one would see that that even within a country like the US, it, it's at 61 to 80 percent, which, you know, for a developed country, maybe you would expect more. So it is a significant problem that we all need to address and give priority to. I'm putting up this slide because I'm going to refer a little later to these different regions and, and particularly the region that the many of the Eastern Caribbean islands fall within sub region four because it relates to some of the points that I will be making with regard to where are the pollution hotspots in, in the region and what are the major sources of wastewater in these particular sub-regions. So this was an assessment done in 2010 that looked at how much domestic waste was ending up in the environment from the various sub-regions. And I would want to highlight in this case subregion four, which really is the Eastern Caribbean. So you look at that and you think, well, in the whole scheme of things, 
it's not that bad, you know, based on, on, on numbers, based on absolute loading. And that's correct. In terms of total loads, what's coming down from the Mississippi River out of the US, uh, what's coming up from the Amazon River in Brazil, what's coming down from the Magdalena River in, in Colombia, those are carrying much larger amounts of untreated wastewater and sediment. But you also have to look at that in terms of the population of those countries. So not to indicate that we need to be less worried about it, but that we have to consider it in the context of our very small sizes, our limited resources, and the fact that we are so dependent on such a small area of coastline, which could become very significantly contaminated. As we looked at this study, we looked throughout the, the region and the different uh, subregions as to where were the major sources of nitrogen and phosphorus. There are two major sources of nitrogen and phosphorus generally, that originating from agriculture and runoff and, and that originating from sewage. And you would find that traditionally and globally and even for the broader regional level, the major sources of nitrogen and phosphorus entering the environment are from agricultural runoff, either from surface runoff, rivers or groundwater, in some cases from natural sources or atmospheric de deposition. What's interesting to note is that in the case of the Eastern Caribbean and the small island, this figure is, you have a much higher percentage of contribution coming from untreated sewage. So I know even when I was working in, in St. Lucia, it, it was always a, a debate as to whether or not it was agriculture causing more pollution, whether it was industry, or whether it was sewage and discharge of untreated sewage um, wastewater. So for the smaller islands, it's definitely something we need to be concerned about. What makes wastewater so interesting and yet so challenging to deal with uh, from a treatment perspective, and I would say even from a monitoring perspective? It contains a variety of what are called stressors. Uh, you have fresh water, which normally would not be considered a fresh water, and in fact, over 99% of wastewater is fresh water, but the other 1% that we are concerned about, the nutrients that can impact on the environment, the bacteria, the pathogens, the endocrine disruptors, those are those new emerging contaminants such as hormones and pharmaceuticals that I'll, I'm gonna mention a little bit later. Uh, we have the suspended solids and sediments, we have heavy metals, and an emerging problem is also microplastics with more wastewater treatment plants now detecting microplastics in the wastewater effluent. Now, this was a question that I posed. So this is not particularly your answers as yet. Uh, I did take a quick look at the, at the polls coming in and I get a feeling that, that these are the similar type of responses I've seen so far. But what I'd like to do is perhaps just Pause a little bit, if I may, Ignatius, and, and just see if anyone is, is willing to react a little bit on this. I saw that quite a number of people voted that they didn't think the existing standards were adequate. And I wondered if any of the participants were willing to jump in and just share what their experience might be with regard to, to sewage standards and their discharge. So I'm, I'm gonna pause and, and just open the floor Anyone just feel free to jump in and, and make a comment because I think your answers actually are very similar to this one. Thank you very much. Go ahead, um, participants. Um, the floor is yours. You can unmute your mics and make your contribution. Hello. Anybody listening to us? It seems like we have some people are chickening out to speak this afternoon. Water Authority. Can yes, you hear me? Nicole, thank you. Okay. Yes. Right. Um, the standards that we have, um, I believe that they are good, but our problem would be um, the regulation of them in our country in terms of yeah. we are trying to aim for them but then when we don't meet them at our plants 
what is the next step? Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for that that feedback, and and that's really such a such a very important point because we have we have heard of efforts in some countries to improve on their discharge standards, uh, to put in place regulations, but ultimately, yes, it does come down to to enforcement. Uh, some cases, it comes down to whether or not treatment plants have the appropriate technology to be able to meet those standards. Uh, in other cases, I know some governments have tried to provide a, a grace period because it means that existing wastewater treatment plants might need to retrofit to be able to meet some of these discharge standards. So, so, so thanks for, for sharing that with us. I, I think it's, a, it's an important point, even as, even as we as organizations try to work with governments to improve uh, discharge standards, we have to consider the capacity to monitor, to enforce, and also the ability of existing uh, sewage treatment plants, hotel package treatment plants, does the existing technology allow them to meet those standards? And if they don't, are there going to be some kind of incentives or disincentives to enable them to comply? So, so, so thanks very much for sharing that. I think very, very relevant to, to our work as organizations. Any other um, immediate reactions before I continue? Okay, if not, then I'll just con con continue onwards with, um, let's see now if this will cooperate. Yes, we, we recently did a, a, a state of marine pollution report uh, would say very still very much you know fresh off the press uh, we haven't promoted a lot of the findings as yet although that's something that we hope to do more uh, this year and the report was one of the first that was based on actual country data this was this is not modeling data this is not you know some theoretical research this was data provided by the countries themselves, and it focused particularly on recreational water quality. It found that with the exception of oxygen and pH, that a significant number of our coastal sites had poor water quality. We had an indication that the pollutant levels tended to be higher in the wet season, which is not so surprising for us who are from the Caribbean. Uh, we have more runoff from, from, from land, we have more flooding, what was perhaps more concerning was the extensive fecal contamination that was found, particularly of Enterococcus and E. coli. And therefore, we identified a number of pollution hotspots associated with river mouths and particular with sewer outfalls. So traditionally, we have used a figure that I think has been around for about 40 years in terms of that 85% of untreated wastewater enters the environment. So there, there was a bit of modeling done as part of this study, which suggests that we have improved a bit. It, it's not perhaps as high as 85 or 90%, but still on average, it was found that perhaps between 65 and 75% of domestic wastewater enters the, the marine environment untreated or only partially treated. So it continues to be a, a significant threat to the marine environment and to our development opportunities. And I wanted to give you a, a, just a visual of uh, some of the metrics that were looked at from the different countries. And you will see on the left, uh, well, both on both sides, we would have samples from the USA, from Colombia, from Guadeloupe, from Trinidad, Dominican Republic. Uh, and what I just wanna bring forward with this is the amount of red. Uh, and in this case, we looked at dissolved inorganic nitrogen and dissolved inorganic phosphorus both of which are found in sewage effluent and both of which contribute significantly to nutrient pollution. And the next one looks at the Enterococcus bacteria. And again, we had samples from Mexico, Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica, Grenada, Guadeloupe, Martinique, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, USBI. And again, when you look at that, yes, for some of the countries, we're not doing too badly in terms of, of the levels of Enterococcus. But when you consider the impacts of human health, uh, they are perhaps a little bit more red than we would like, meaning that for those samples, 
they actually failed uh, water quality uh, standard WHO, World Health Organization, or US Environmental Protection Agency standards, again showing that we do have areas of poor recreational water quality throughout much of the, the region. But I, I wanted with, with this slide to, to also highlight that it's not only about the activities that are taking place on land. I, I was watching a, a program earlier about the cruise ship that was entering St. Lucia for the first time since March last year, and I will leave it there. Uh, but the reality is that the, the, the shipping, the maritime industry, particularly the, the cruise ships, are potential major sources of of pollution and in particular of sewage and nutrient pollution. And, and the, the table on, on the left, uh, this is a report card. It's done, I think, every, every year by an international non-governmental organization called Friends of the Earth. And they do a sort of ranking on a grading and assessment of different cruise liners and how they rank in terms of sewage treatment, air pollution, water quality, et cetera. So again, if you just take a quick look at the first column, sewer treatment, no one there is ranking A, no one is ranking B. I mean, there are a couple that may get a, maybe a basic pass of a C, and then quite a number, well, a few with Ds, Fs, uh, which basically mean they're, they're failing. So this is something that, that we also have to be concerned about because many of the islands don't have appropriate facilities for the pump out of sewage and wastewater coming from yachts or coming from larger cruise vessels and this is definitely a, a source of pollution that we need to be concerned about i wanted to touch a little bit about the framework that i work under in terms of the unep cartagena convention and some of the measures that we are trying to put in place in many of the countries some of the opportunities uh, the land-based sources of marine pollution protocol is a regional agreement that all the governments of the region have uh, are in the process of signing on to or, or have signed on to. And it provides a regional framework for establishing sewage effluent standards as well as best management practices. At the moment, these are the number of countries throughout the region who have formally ratified the protocol to date. So, we are not doing too badly. I think the total number is at 15. Uh, we've heard good news that maybe St. Kitts and Nevis uh, might be considering, Suriname might be considering ratification as, as well. But for something as important as pollution, we really be believe that it's important that all the governments of the region uh, formally sign on to this agreement and take some, make a political commitment to address the issue of pollution. Our experience is that uh, we tend to find that many governments respond when there is a regional or a global agreement, which I wouldn't say compels them, but encourages them to take some kind of action. And within the LBS, the Land-Based Sources of Marine Pollution Protocol, those countries who have formally signed on to it actually commit to do certain things with regard to wastewater. Uh, they commit to regulate it in an improved way and they commit to minimize the amount of wastewater that enters the environment, and particularly what's known as class one waters, which essentially means those waters which are being used for recreational purposes. It's a country's uh, being encouraged to promote domestic wastewater reuse where appropriate, promote the use of cleaner te technologies, and also use technologies and approaches that are appropriate uh, to their national circumstances. Now, for those who of you who are involved in monitoring in any way, and I know we, we have a mixture of persons who have been involved as, as, as operators, uh, maybe there are a couple of you who actually work in labs. Uh, these are the, the standards that have been set through the land-based sources of marine pollution protocol. And you will see that they are the typical standards that would normally apply that you would have seen through our work in public health, uh, we have total suspended solids, biological oxygen demand, pH, uh, the bacterial levels, fecal coliform. And then we have two classes of water. Class one waters are those which are used for recreational purposes or those which are, have significant ecosystems, coral reefs, mangroves, seagrass beds that we would like to protect. 
while class two waters, I would say, relate perhaps more to port areas, commercial areas that are not used for residential purposes. Question as to, to what extent are our uh, sewage effluent standards meeting, our sewage effluent um, uh, measurements meeting these standards? Uh, to what extent are these standards being enforced in each of the countries? I think those are uh, uh, major questions to be, to be looked at. And you also look at this and you realize, but this has no requirement for nutrients. And nutrients has been identified as a significant pollutant. And one of the areas we're looking at now is seeing if we need to define new nutrient standards. The protocol also obligated contracting parties to take action with regard to new systems. So new domestic wastewater systems should meet these standards immediately. Uh, there is a bit of a grace period for existing wastewater systems so that they could probably retrofit and improve. And when we negotiated the protocol, we also recognized that there would be a significant amount of persons, particularly in the small islands, relying on household systems and septic tanks. So again, it was recognized that we aren't going to be able to have the resources to just discontinue the use of septic tanks but we also realize that septic tanks are not going to be a long-term answer to our wastewater management team. At, at some point, you are going to reach a level where it's no longer sustainable to continue to use septic tanks. And that's when we have to think of either other forms of decentralized treatment or other forms of centralized treatment. We, we pulled this just to give an example of some of the parameters that are being monitored throughout many of the countries in, in the region, uh, from total nitrogen, total phosphorus, fecal coliform, and pterococci. And, and just the, the general message here is that there are certain parameters that are most often used. Uh, for example, fecal coliform is, is probably one of the most common ones used for, for microbiological contamination. Uh, typically, you find that total nitrogen and total phosphorus are measured mostly in domestic wastewater, but there are quite a number of parameters that have been identified as being useful and important that are not being monitored for. And, and this means that there, there needs to be probably more capacity building, training, adjustment of standards to meet some of these emerging uh, criteria. One of, the, one of the recent strategies that we have developed at the Secretariat is one looking at nutrients reduction from various sources, whether it be agriculture, tourism, wastewater. So we are hoping that governments at least recognize there's a need for them to develop national wastewater sewage pollution reduction plans with a focus on nutrients. And, and we're, we're in the process now of trying to mobilize some resources that could assist governments in developing those national plans and setting themselves some targets within which to address sewage. And within that strategy, we have recognized that there's an important need to focus on domestic wastewater effluent, uh, for example, to ensure that they meet the necessary national standards relating to effluent but there's also recognition that there are a number of, of new solutions that are uh, more nature-based in focus uh, that, that involve the reuse of treated waste, as you saw in the video, for fertilizer, for irrigation, for biogas. And this also links to one of the important sustainable development goals, sustainable development goal six on water and sanitation. And in particular, goal 6.3, which talks about improving water quality by reducing pollution, reducing untreated wastewater and increasing recycling and safe reuse. Um, we, are, we are happy to see the work that Kawasa and CWWA and Caribbean Development Bank and UN Habitat are now doing with many of the countries to really raise the profile of having to address domestic wastewater pollution within a more integrated context that looks at both wastewater and water resources. And then we, look, we need to look at the enabling conditions. And this is something that perhaps not new to any of you. It's something we've been talking about for a while. Uh, some countries, I think, have advanced a little bit more than others, but it remains a, a challenge. Uh, how do we continue to strengthen our institutional frameworks and mechanisms? How do we strengthen our policy re regarding wastewater management? 
we have, based on our work, we recognize that the issue of data uh, is still a challenge. And data on wastewater, particularly on water quality, is an even greater challenge because of the issue of tourism. And, and we, we are very cautious about you know, sharing bad news. We can't afford to say that one of our most popular beaches has failed standards because of sewage discharge. So this is something that we need to address as a region. Uh, we need to improve how our political directorate and our policymakers make decisions. Uh, there needs to be ongoing strengthened capacity like is like being done through, through this form of, of webinar, get more stakeholder involvement, and ultimately try to find more ways of, of innovative financing. And there are a couple of opportunities, and I would dare say that perhaps some of you may not even be aware of some of the work that's being done through some of these projects. Uh, there's a project currently being implemented by UNEP entitled the Jeff IW Eco, Integrating Water, Land, and Ecosystems Management. And I've just pulled out a, a couple of the uh, recent activities that have been done to show that there are these types of opportunities. And in St. Kitts Nevis, there's work going on in Bastyr, the College Street got to, to help prevent runoff. Uh, there was also a, the small grants program that supported water harvesting and storage in St. Kitts and Nevis and the development of a wastewater treatment plant in Discovery Bay in Jamaica. Uh, just recently, not yet published, there's some research on the water quality levels in Sufre Bay in St. Lucia. And um, again, another St. Lucia, uh, uh, Mr. Kasba Didier did an did a analysis of wastewater management by the yachting sector. And it's a very interesting report as to how we should look at, at wastewater uh, from tourism sector and, and the yachting establishment in particular. And then there's ongoing work planned by the OECS to provide more training and capacity building on water and wastewater management. So there are these op opportunities. A project that you may have heard about, which is one that we are also directly involved in, is the uh, Jeff-funded Caribbean Regional Fund for Wastewater Management. Uh, again, focusing on a range of different topics, uh, improving policy and legislation, knowledge management, financing, and small-scale community solutions. And, and the map there indicates the different countries, 18 countries within Latin America and the Caribbean that we'll be working with over the next three years. What we expect to see out of a project such as Crew Plus, um, the legislative frameworks, the enforcement, the coordination among the different agencies in the region to look at different financing options. We all know that our governments, and I, I'm including that, our governments don't have the resources. So how can we look at more sustainable financing for water and wastewater investments? We have to move away from huge centralized systems. They are probably not going to work for many of the small islands. And we need to now consider more community-based. And here I'm not saying in not the best that's available. We can have low tech solutions that meet all the standards, but, but are more decentralized in nature and function more on, on a nature-based approach. And then we need to make this information available to the general public, to technical people working in the utilities, uh, to our policymakers to ensure that they do make these sorts of informed decisions. And finally, there's a there's a, a, a third project I wanted to hi highlight that's covering all of the countries of the Caribbean, uh, African Caribbean and Pacific projects. So not only being done in, in, in our part of the world, but also in Africa and the Pacific Islands. And I want to highlight just these four opportunities that again, we have, if our focal points reach out to us and said they would like to develop a pollution reduction plan on domestic wastewater, or they would like to update their national legislation and regulations on FUN discharges, or they would like to implement a, a decentralized rural community intervention. And these are, this is, we have resources that we've mobilized, we've reached out to our focal points, asking them for interest. I think we've got one response from one country, and I'm sure that this does not reflect the need that many of our countries have. So it, it is some, something that we, we need to ensure that there's greater knowledge about these. And I, and I wanted to, to wind down by returning to a topic that I mentioned right at the beginning. And, and it's this 
vexing issue one may say about these emerging pollutants and, and they are a concern and, and they are a concern in many of our islands that don't have the capacity to, to, to treat it or to detect it or even to understand what impacts they might have. So yes, it's a concern. We've read about it, but we don't understand what it means. What does this mean there in terms of, of, of impacts? Um, many of our existing policies, laws, and regulations don't talk about these emerging pollutants. Many, many of, our, of our institutions who monitor wastewater don't have the capacity to monitor. And if we are going to look at issues such as the reuse of treated wastewater, we need to detect and ensure that we're not creating another risk by reusing treated wastewater that perhaps might have high levels of a hormone or pharmaceutical. So there has been some, some work done by the University of the West Indies that does su suggest that depending upon specific locations that there are levels of pharmaceuticals or antibiotics or even illicit, illicit drugs. I think there was a study done on, on cannabis levels in wastewater treatment and some interesting findings coming out of the University of the West Indies on that. So if we have to look at this issue, we, we need to see how we can monitor for it. And that's where I think we need to con consider some of our research institutions, uh, some of our academic institutions, uh, St. George's University, University of the West Indies, uh, University of Ghana, of Suriname, need to look at these. And we need to maybe look a little bit at the, at the methodology and how do we interpret some of that data. So I, I wanted to come to another question that I have asked. I have just a couple of more slides, but again, I'm going to pause here because this is become an extremely topical point. Uh, we've spoken a lot about trying to find ways of reusing treated wastewater or sewage or sludge. Uh, it's being done particularly in parts of Asia, in parts of Africa. This question was asked of all of you, but these are not your results. I actually did this poll for government focal points about a month ago. So what you're seeing there are their responses. And I wondered if anyone was willing to, again, just kick in and say, from your personal point, what do you think might be some of the barriers for us as a region or for you and your individual to promote this issue? Some of the responses that we got from, from that survey of our government, technical people, a public perception, ignorance, infrastructure, lack of standards, greater public education. I mean, would you think that these are the things that need to be looked at? Or what would you think would be maybe some of the barriers that we have now to promoting wastewater reuse? And I'll pause again, Ignatius, to allow maybe persons to just, you know, think or quickly react if, if they have any thoughts on this, over. Yeah, all good, please proceed, um, participants. Let's, uh, uh, we want this to be interactive, so please have some comments. I think in the chat box, somebody says, um, definitely public perception, more awareness and culture shift towards wastewater. Let me open. Hi, good evening. Hi, Hi, good evening. Yes, this is uh, Timothy Augustus here um, from based in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, in terms of the water reuse, I mean, wastewater in itself is already a taboo subject where, you know, people look at it as the last thing to deal with in, in any organization, um, even in, in, in housing developments and so on. And to now see that we could reuse it it is going to be a serial uh, a, a, a cultural battle, you know, to get people's minds around that because, and then we have the issue with just the normal treating of this water is, is also, uh, you know, funding issues. We have lack of enforcement. We have uh, even agencies not wanting to really own wastewater so i don't know it's going to be a very difficult journey to deal with this no thanks timothy and you've made a you've made some extremely valid points and it's some of the the, the battles that i sometimes have with with my colleagues who are outside of the region where they think that it will just happen and it, it won't i mean as has been said it, it, it will take 
it will take a real major cultural shift. It will take education. It, it, it will take, you know, acceptance. What we have found, because we, we did a little bit of a, of a survey and actually found that there are some, uh, some commercial establishments. Many of you would, would know that a lot of the hotels are using uh, treated wastewater to irrigate their, their golf courses. I understand that there are even some of the, uh, some, some establishments here that are reusing it, but they are not really making a big public issue out of it. It's sort of being done because they have seen that there is a benefit of savings, for example, on golf courses in, in terms of using treated portable water for irrigation, in terms of reducing on the cost of fertilizer. So, so those are really some, some practical uh, elements that we have seen in some private sector to be able to, to do that. Uh, someone has also raised, I, I think, a, a, a very important point about the, the actual and perceived cost of wastewater treatment and reuse. And, and a lot of it is coming down to the economics and the fact that I think traditionally, a lot of our decision makers and our policy makers have seen having to deal with wastewater as, and I'm no pun intended, as money thrown down the drain. There, there's, no, there's no return on investment. There are no benefits apart from when it's, it's, it's really creating a health hazard and they have to address it politically or maybe when it's linked to uh, tour, tourism. So it, it also speaks to, uh, you know, getting our economists more involved. Can we can we demonstrate that there that there are significant economic benefits? Or if you do a cost benefit analysis, you can show that by treating wastewater or by reusing treated wastewater, you are actually creating some some socioeconomic benefits. And 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 yes, uh, you know the 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 need for for showcasing examples of where this is happening. Thanks for that recommendation. I think that's excellent. Uh, I, I sometimes when I go and search for case studies on wastewater treatment, I, I, I get all the examples from Asia and Africa. And we know this happening in the region, but we're, we're not getting that or being able to, to, to see those working in our environment, in our socioeconomic conditions, in our size, because certainly my feeling is that in many cases, when we see those positive examples and case studies, then there's a greater chance of it being replicated and, and upscaled. So I know, I, I, I know we have our work uh, cut out for us in this new project, uh, Crew Plus, because one of the things that we are trying to do is raise this awareness and break this bit of cultural barrier that we have. And I really think we need to bring on board the behavioral scientists and the social scientists, because this is and the economists, because this is not simply an environmental issue if we want to make that, uh, that, that change. So, so thanks so much for that, for that feedback. I, I, I think those were excellent uh, comments. And maybe just to continue with the final uh, part of my presentation, which is hopefully now going into the, the, the positive a little bit, the opportunities and the fact that the narrative is changing. And I think it's for us as a region, for us in, in our immediate sphere, how can we help change that narrative where we do have that influence? So uh, for many of you who I'm sure now attending many of these webinars, a lot more reference to the circular economy, uh, which basically means maximizing the use of resources and preventing waste generation. And that's been applied to all aspects of solid, liquid, and hazardous waste with the view that you are saving on the use of primary materials, you are saving on the use of, of energy, and you are, essentially it's a win-win. There's also the greater push for nature-based solutions. And we have seen it traditionally in the wastewater field uh, in the area of constructed wetlands, but now there's also a greater focus on using natural systems of mangroves and so on for wastewater treatment. But as we saw in the video, there's also the talk about green infrastructure, having, you know, having buildings built in a way so that there are a greater amount of, of green spaces. And then the traditional triple R for water resource management. As we generate water resources, we generate, as we generate water, as we provide water to people, we generate wastewater. And as I think was, was mentioned earlier, a lot of the focus has been on portable water provision without perhaps as much focus as to 
what are we doing with the wastewater when we provide someone with a flush toilet? Um, do we have the capacity to, to manage that? As I mentioned, I personally, and this is might be my, my, my personal opinion, we, we are perhaps not ready yet for the Israel level of technology to reuse treated wastewater for drinking purposes. But we have seen the opportunities, whether or not it be for industrial cooling, for non-drinking pur purposes, for, for irrigation of non-edible um, non um, vegetation, like golf courses, which is already being done. So these are some of the issues that, that we need to look at. Uh, from a sustainable agricultural standpoint, uh, we have heard from our agricultural specialists about, about the shortages in some of the nutrient nitrates, phosphates, etc., and the opportunity to be able to extract that, for example, from, from sludge, and then the whole aspect of financing and the more innovative financing mechanisms that we need to employ, possibly looking at public-private uh, sector partnerships. So I found this, this slide, which, which I thought very nicely depict what we are trying, the, the narrative we are trying to change when it comes down to wastewater and, and trying to make it seem that it's not only a cost, but also a potential revenue earner. And, and we also have to think of it as not just the wastewater from, from feces, which is perhaps, which is where the yuck factor comes in and where people prefer not to think about it, but when you think of the other wastewater from dishwashing, from laundries, from sinks, from kitchens, from and even urine, I mean, these offer great opportunities for recovery, particularly of nutrients and of water and of energy. So reality, reality check. There is limited reuse now, even with those examples that identified that if I look at the region as, as a whole, there is a lot, there is a lot more scope for reuse of treated wastewater. There's a concern about the technology that we use. And, and yeah, we, we think, look, we can't even manage you know, certain things. How are we going to ensure that our wastewater is, 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 is being treated appropriately for reuse? And in that regard, our colleagues at Environmental Health Departments and Ministry of Health are very concerned that we, we are able to maintain standards. And, and, and one of the ways that I know some countries are approaching this is coming up with wastewater reuse policies. And I know work has been done in Barbados. Work is about to start in Trinidad that, that looks at that. Um, and then how can we identify where is the greatest potential uh, for the reuse of treated wastewater? I mentioned a bit about the nature-based solutions. And again, just a little bit of a visual as to what some of those could be from constructed wetlands to green urban spaces, to natural wetlands, to mangroves. These are all being used as part of a more ecosystem-based management of approach, uh, living, as you say, more in harmony with nature, but also uh, looking for opportunities where these can be as effective as the traditional treatment systems. And I wanted to, to, to end again by a, maybe a, a bit of an assessment that was done uh, through University of the West Indies, Sermis, uh, throughout the wider, or throughout the English-speaking Caribbean, as to what various experts thought was lacking or not lacking as it relates to uh, wastewater management. And, and here there, I'm gonna zoom in then on the second graph from the left, which speaks about domestic wastewater effluent. So generally between 80 and 100% of the persons felt that legislation wasn't too bad regulations a little bit behind, but again, not too bad. Uh, but there was no management plan or very few had management plans, very few had strategic plans and policy a little bit lagging behind the legislation and regulation. And, and from my experience, though, I know a lot of the legislation that, that we've seen is almost legislation that has evolved from the old public health acts and, and many countries have still not evolved past that. And then we asked another question as to what did persons think about the level of treatment of land-based sources of pollution? Again, zoning in on the second one from, from the left, which talks about domestic wastewater treatment. And again, the response felt that uh, I would say very few people, maybe less than 10%, felt that the treatment was better than what was agreed. A majority of persons felt that it was worse. 
And some people actually said there was no agreed level for the treatment of wastewater, suggesting that we still have uh, some work to do. So moving forward, the recommendations are nothing radical, uh, but I think they still remain important. The whole idea about the education awareness, if we need to change some of those perceptions, that's where it has to start. Uh, we have to move away from the traditional end of pipe treatment. We've been talking about the need to minimize and prevent at, at source, especially when it comes down to some of these new contaminants. We need to improve our ability to monitor. As someone said, you can't manage what you can't monitor. This is definitely the case with, with wastewater as well. We need the continued improvement of our policies and legislation, which means we need to do the periodic evaluations of them. So having a public health act from the 1970s, quite frankly, doesn't cut it anymore. We, we need to move past that. Uh, partnerships are key, public, private, uh, the regulator, uh, the utility. I certainly found that there's a bit of a divide between utilities and environmental agencies and then the authorities who actually reg regulate. So again, I think we're moving in the right direction, but I think a lot more needs to be done. And then the need for ongoing training and, and technology upgrades. And again, just, just to congrat congratulate Kawas and Ignatius on this. So my final slide is, is a sort of a bit of a call to action because you know you might be there sitting, well, this is great, nice presentation, but what can I do? I mean, I'm just an operator. I'm just working in a utility. I have a boss who has a boss who has another boss and I still have to deal with the government and the ministry. Uh, so part of it is knowing what's op what opportunities are, are there. And, and I'm happy to share with Ignatius afterwards, for example, who are the focal points in your respective countries for UNEP? for our work, but also for some of the projects. Uh, we've certainly seen that for the countries who have signed on to the LDS protocol, that it has catalyzed a bit of a change. Um, government of Barbados has admitted to me that some of the work that they have done on standards would not have been done if they were not a contracting party to the protocol. Uh, financial and technical support is a need, but it does exist from some of these projects. But we're not getting the requests to respond from where the need is greatest. So we get someone saying, oh, we don't need any more training in, in, in this. So how can we ensure that we're re responding? As someone has, has mentioned, and as we saw from one of the first uh, graphs, we do need to look at, at improving our effluent standards. Uh, we do need to look at improving, so in some cases, our policy and legal frameworks, particularly as it relates to tariff. And I just wanted to end by saying that we at UNEP and the, at the Hina Convention Secretariat, we of course continue to be committed to collaborate. That's the word of the day with Kawasa and the many other regional partners who are working to improve. And I hear I put it, it is water and wastewater management. I, I, as much as this presentation has focused a lot on wastewater management, I wanna end by saying that it, it, it cannot be divorced from the issue of water resources management. And we do have to look at at IWRM in a, in a more consistent way. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for the time and for the interaction. It's been great. And um, yes, if there are any other questions, comments, feedback, uh, all of the contacts are here. I will also be uh, sharing this presentation with Ignatius so he could disseminate to anyone who would love to go through it again or even share it with your colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chris, for this very fascinating journey and within within uh, maybe about 50 minutes. We highly appreciate this. I should let you know that we have um, quite a few of the participants here actively um, undertaking tutorials and um, wastewater management to do the ABC certification pro um, exams. And some of them completed exams last Friday, and I want to congratulate all those who passed. And um, I will not get into the list of names, but it's the first time we had over 65 um, participants from across the islands doing the exam, um, that number. And um, it shows that there is keen interest. And those who have been following the webinars and participating in the tutorials, or maybe going back to our YouTube postings of the webinars seem to have been the ones who um, passed with flying colors. So I encourage you and others to do that, to join us. But thanks a lot, Chris. 
Any questions do you have? Participants, let me check the chat. No, there are no questions there. Uh, Chris, you, you mentioned um, the, the nature-based solutions. Um, how, uh, how well is um, this being adopted in the region, particularly say um, constructed wetlands? Yeah, um, thanks, thanks, Ignatius, and I, I'm glad you, you raised that. Just, uh, oh, I would say maybe two months ago, we, we partnered with the Nature Conservancy to try to document a little bit as to where nature-based solutions were being employed and, and, and trying to get at least a bit of an overview in terms of uh, what were some of the enabling factors for those countries that they looked at that that, that stimulated the use of nature-based solutions? Could they give any examples of things that, they, that encouraged them to move in that direction? So we were able to get some, some nice experiences from Grenada, from Jamaica, from Dominican Republic. Um, we also got some information from St. Lucia. So there is, there is evidence that there is a lot, I wouldn't say a lot, there is some level of it taking place not at, not as much i would say at a national level or within the the commercial utilities but we are finding a number of private sector facilities particularly the hotels doing it uh, we've also seen it in some rural communities that have got together and been able to do a, a small uh, constructed wetlands or in some cases a natural wet wetlands and, and one of the, the points that was raised as a result of, of the partnership and the study, and we have a published report that I'm happy to, to share, is that there were some questions, and I think it came up also in one of the chats, um, the, the cost of these versus a traditional system. How much does it cost to, to set up a constructed wetlands? Uh, what were the benefits? Did it meet national standards? Uh, there was also a question as to the lack of familiarity with the regulators about constructed wetlands. So, you know, if you go to them with a traditional package treatment plan, then they, they can add up the, you know, the, the know exactly what to expect, but not quite sure how do you, you know, ensure that a constructed wetlands is in fact going to meet those standards. So those are two of the issues that came up, Ignatius, but I definitely think there's opportunity, as someone mentioned, if we showcase more of those, showcase that they're working and that they're effective and that they're also cost effective, I, I think is something that we'll have to do. Absolutely. Any questions from the floor? Ah, yeah, that's, yes, Timothy here again from um, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I, uh, Mr. Kogan, I heard you mention uh, going away from the centralized wastewater treatment systems. And uh, of course, here we have the authority um, constructing decentralized wastewater systems and you know trying to increase their capacity. Um, could you just explain you know why you would want to to go different from that? Yeah, and and it's it's a maybe I should preface that by by saying that there is a I guess a general feeling that you know we can take a, a one size fit one size cap fits all of approach to the issue of wastewater management. And, and we are finding that, that that is in fact not the case. Uh, we're finding that depending upon topography, on population size and so on, uh, depending on, on levels of groundwater or just depending on the amount of, of funding that's available for government to invest in a centralized system is, is going to impact on its efficiency and effectiveness. So if you have a, a, a significantly large urban population, if there are systems in place for collection, effective collection of the wastewater, and you have economies of, of, of scale in terms of being able to put in uh, plants that bring it to secondary level or ideally even tertiary level or some form of reuse, great. Um, once you've done all your analyses and your feasibility and so on, and that works. What we're finding though, is that in, in some of the countries, particularly some of the, the smaller islands, 
the opportunity to, to have a, a, a fully centralized system that covers a, a large area is not as cost effective, uh, especially when you're talking about some of the rural areas because of topography, you might have a community with a handful of households and the cost of then collecting their waste and trying to bring it to a centralized facility and what they would have to pay for that then mitigates against that being an effective solution. And in those cases, what we are trying to promote is more fit for purpose solutions. So not diminishing the level of treatment or facility that we provide, but considering other options. So in the case of nature-based solutions, in the case of decentralized approaches, it, it's really to have something that, that is more responsive to the socioeconomic and the geographical conditions that are there. Uh, but if you do have an, an, an ability to have a, a well-functioning centralized system with all your balances in place and all your, and all your monitoring in, in place, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating against that. Um, but what I would advocate is that if we are using these centralized systems, we also have to think of ways of making them more efficient. So think of ways that you can use solar as part of the energy, maybe not such a challenge in Trinidad, but I know oil is also, you know, but that's a consideration. Uh, is there a way of, of extracting the nutrients from the effluent? Is there a way of reusing it in industrial cooling and so on? So, so those are, would, would, would be some of the ideas that I would bring forward as it relates to, to maximizing the efficiency of a centralized system. Over. Yeah, thank Great, you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that um, Anderson Bowen of Barbados had said he would like to see the report. I don't know which report specifically, but um, and he says he agrees that the cost effectiveness that's in the chat um, will be a significant factor and that will definitely be a key factor for moving in that direction. Thank yes, uh, yes, and thanks. And definitely, I, I would share that uh, that that bit of com compilation of, of work that was done by by UNEP and the, and the, and the Nature Conservancy and, and some of the some of the recommendations as to how we could go about maybe expanding on the use of nature based solutions. And, and this is some some something that we also have recognized Ignatius and, and we're talking, for example, maybe at the during the second phase of the crew plus academy training that we perhaps try to customize some training that looks at this whole issue of of wastewater reuse and of nature based solutions and so on, because we realize there's a there's not a lot of information from the Caribbean about that, and I, I think it's an important point. So, so thanks. For that. Yeah, in, indeed, there are, there are some private sector um, um, businesses that are using um, the nature based solutions, and I think there is there are great opportunities, particularly in a lot of our rural coastal zone areas where you do not have centralized systems and not even um, there uh their sewage systems are functioning properly so um you know the the septic tank systems either so where where that is available so these are challenges and issues around the region that i i think it is as we have started and even people working in the sector and which is why we host the seminars that we expose our operators to as many issues and the emerging um opportunities and the challenges that we face um, across the sector. There, there's just one new piece of information I just came upon recently was the Escaso agreement. And I was trying to figure, this is another one that may, that may well uh, be useful in enhancing what the, or strengthening the hand of the um, environmental departments as it were, and, and the countries in trying to roll out some of these programs. Yes, agreed. I, I mean, I, I think as all of us who are, who are in our own role trying to advocate for, for things to be improved and, and get better is that part of that information, part of that process is, is getting the information, packaging it in a way that we can then communicate to the general public, to the private sector, to our policymakers, to our political di directorate. Um, you know, we, we can't go just singing a purely 
environmental tune. Um, it does have to relate to, to quality of life, to human health, and also to the to, to sort of the economic prospects that we may be diminishing if we continue business as usual. Well, um, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, I think if you have no further questions, I'd like to thank Mr. Christopher Corbin for sharing with us his valuable time this afternoon in helping to continue the advocacy for improving the quality of life in our region through our improved waste water management and employing um, improved strategies and methods to, to achieve that. So I'd like to thank you very much, Chris, on behalf of all of us at Kawasa and all our operators across the region who joined us this afternoon. And we'll continue to be good partners in that effort. Thank you very much. I'm Ignatius Jean from the Kawasa Secretariat signing off and wishing you a safe, um, well, wishing you a safe afternoon. I know that we have some tropical um, weather systems in the region approaching us. So let us, it's the season. So let's keep our eyes open. Thank you very much and have a good evening.